We're doing a series in evangelism, and last week I spoke on the subject of if somebody wants to become a Christian, what do you tell them to do? What do you actually tell them to do? And I said, I called it three steps to becoming a Christian, and I said you have to understand and believe three things. Who God is, really understand who he is, what he offers in Jesus, and how he wants us to respond. And then, of course, you have to need to respond by trusting in him. And the context of these three things is the big picture of what God is doing in the universe to rid it of evil forever. And there's a war going on, a great battle, and it's important to see the gospel as part of this great battle against evil. Um, and often when the gospel is presented, uh, it's done in a, a cut-down way that only really covers the last two things and something like, because of God's love for us, Jesus, the Son of God, came to the earth. He died and paid the price for everything we've done wrong so that we can be free and live forever with him. All we have to do is to put our trust in him. And this is true. This is all good. And missing out the context of the the whole purpose for the war that God has against evil and his goal ultimately to get rid of it and how you're either on one side or the other and to see the idea of, of, of changing to being to uh, being on God's side in this. Um, now, uh, that's fine and there's nothing wrong with what I've got up there. It's, 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 it's all correct. But what I want to do is to ask you an interesting question this morning. How did Jesus explain the gospel? Because he'd not died yet. How did he explain it? How did he present the gospel? Can anybody tell me? Yeah? Yeah? The kingdom of heaven, he talked about that. Yeah? That's, that's good. What else? What did he tell people to do? Repent, yep, that's true, yep, but, but like did he talk about his, his, his trusting in his shed blood to take away their sin? Not really, a little bit. It's kind of, you, now as we read back, we can see that it's kind of in there a bit. But what he actually told them to do, uh, very sim uh, simply, he said, follow me. He said it to fishermen, literally to follow him. Many people, it wasn't actually literally following, but it was aligning themselves with him. So it was to women who risked their social, social disapproval by following him. It was for tax collectors who, to follow him, meant that they had to, to stop the way they were living. Um, a very wealthy man, and to follow him, this man had to sell everything that he had. And so... Mostly this wasn't literal, sometimes it was, but it was follow me was his, his uh, command to them. And I'd like to illustrate what it means to follow Jesus with a, a couple of stories. Um, <clears throat> so the first one of these I'm calling GPS fail. So Robert Jones, and this is a story in England a number of years ago, Robert Jones said he trusted his navigational system and continued to follow it. When it told him the steep, narrow footpath he was driving was a road. I don't know if you've ever had this. You're, you're following Google or whatever, and it tells you to turn. You think, I can't do that. Anyway, he trusted this implicitly, and um, things didn't go that well. His BMW nearly plunged down a 100-foot cliff on Todmorden, West Yorkshire, he was only stopped from falling after his vehicle rammed into a fence. Police and rescue teams then spent nine hours rescuing him and his car following the incident. The 43-year-old, who works as a driver, said that he relies on his GPS for his job and described the incident as a nightmare. He told the uh, Halifax Evening Courier, it kept insisting the path was a road, even as it was getting narrower and steeper, so I just trusted it. You don't expect to be taken nearly off a cliff. 
Mr. Jones added, I guess I'm just lucky the car didn't slip all the way over the edge. Mr. Jones now faces court action for driving without due care and attention. So what's the problem here? He trusted, he followed what he was told to do, but it wasn't the right thing that he was told to do. And so the question of following Jesus is, is Jesus worthy to be followed? Because this is a life and death scenario, what we decide to do. Um, so what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? So I think it's a particularly good example, this one I've just given you, because following and obeying are the same thing in this story. To follow your GPS is to obey the instructions from your GPS, to do what it says. And the problem with him was, wasn't that he was putting his trust, he shouldn't be so trusting, but he was trusting the wrong thing. He was trusting something that was broken. And so I want to suggest there are four ways in which we follow Jesus. The first is we follow his leadership. The second is we allow him to have control. The third way we follow is by following the cost he asks for us. And the fourth way, and I'm going to explain what I mean by this because it doesn't sound very good, the fourth is we follow him to death. So first of all, I'm going to talk about following his leadership. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one ever comes to the Father except through me. He claims to be a leader, and he claims that he is the one who we, we look to to, to, to follow as our leader. And I want to tell a story. A number of years ago, Anne and I went on a, uh, to celebrate our wedding anniversary, we went on a dog sledding expedition in Algonquin Park. And it was the most amazing experience. You go up there a, a, a day before and they train you how to, how to, you get your own pack of six dogs and your own sled and they train you how to, to work with the dogs and everything. And then <clears throat> you set off. And uh, they tell us that the dogs are pack animals and every pack has a leader. And you've got to provide leadership to the pack because if you don't provide leadership, they'll do it themselves. So it's very important that you, you're the leader. And um, um, in our leader, in our pack, it was very clear who the leader was. The leader was, can you see which one's the leader? It's the one at the front there who's looking straight at me. His name was Luke. And he, he basically, he was, they will look to him to what to do. And I had to make sure that Luke was doing what I wanted to do. And he was, he was good. He was great. Um, you look at the other dogs. They're okay, they're lovely dogs, but they're not leaders. Luke was the leader. But, and he is paying attention the whole time. He's looking, he's waiting for instructions, constantly watching me um, just to see what I'm doing. Yes, go ahead, yeah. So when it's my turn to be the musher... Oh, I'm going to tell the story. You can tell it. You can tell it. You're with, so, so it's Anne's turn to be the musher. Go on then. My turn to be the musher. And you get the dog started. You say, go, Luke, go. Nothing happens. <laughs> this dog looks back, looks past me, looks at Andrew. Here it is. This is him looking at me. This is what happened. <laughs> He's looking at me. And Anne's saying, go, Luke, go. And I say, let's go, Luke. Vroom, <laughs> we're off. <laughs> now... After a while, we got, we got, he got used to um, Anne being, the, being in charge and being the leader. But it was me the one that was the one that was there to start with. So, uh, and um, at the end of the day, they all went to sleep. So, this, I'm telling you this story because it was about leadership about who you look to and there was a very strong concept of leadership in that experience and allowing him to have control which is my, the second part of following Jesus is part of leadership it's allowing that person allowing the leader to have control giving the ability to make the choices and that takes trust and hu human beings we, we don't like being out of control it's not something we're comfortable with um, but Jesus says, I want you to trust me enough to be in control of your life. I want you to trust me enough. 
Now, the problem is that the way that Jesus wants to lead us has a cost. And we're going to talk now about the way that Jesus pitched his, um, his gospel. Now, you've heard of the expression, a sales pitch. And a sales pitch is you, you know, you say how good what it is you've got, and, and at the end of your pitch, you want them to buy into what you have. And sales pitches usually go through, you know, what's in it for you, and why you'll be better off if you have what I had. Now, I want you to listen to Jesus' sales pitch. And you'll probably agree, he's not had much training in modern sales techniques. Um, <clears throat> now, large crowds were accompanying Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I just want to say, Jesus never told us to hate anybody. He's using this as a figure of speech. Comparatively, compared with how much you love me, you, it will look like hatred towards others because like, it's, it's, the difference is so great. Uh, verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down first and compute the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Actually, I have a story on Wellesley in Parliament, just near where we are. They actually went to build a tower and they ran out of money after two floors. And for about 10 years, there was this like half-finished tower <laughs> and in the end they sold it and someone else finished it up. It looks very silly when you haven't got enough. So what he's saying here is like, you need to work out to start with, are you going to commit to this? Because there's a cost. And don't like change your mind halfway through because, oh, you didn't realize what was involved. He says, understand what's involved in following me. Verse 29, otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish the tower, all who see it will begin to make fun of him. And they'll say, this man built uh, and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to confront another king in battle will not sit down first and determine whether he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he cannot succeed, he'll send a representative while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, uh, not one of you can be my disciple if he does not renounce all of his possessions. Um, hang on, Jesus, this isn't a very good sales pitch. Like, are we told we have to renounce everything? Um, uh, just by the way, um, it says renounce your possessions. What that means here, Jesus never told told us we shouldn't have possessions. He never told us it was wrong to have possessions. But what he's telling us is that what we have actually belongs to him. My house actually belongs to him, and so I use it for his glory. I have a car. It's actually Jesus' car. I'm just driving it, but it's actually Jesus' car. All of the things that I have belong to Jesus, and I'm using them. My, all my money belongs to him. That is what he means at this time. So why would anyone go for that? Why would anyone go for what Jesus is saying here? Well, let's look at um, the last thing. Um, what is the good bit? Is there some good bit that's coming up now? He's going to say, well, it's worth the cost. It's death. <laughs> or what seems like it. <laughs> so what Jesus said, let's look at, um, um, actually, we're going to end up by seeing that it's life. So Mark 8, then Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And then he says, forever who wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. Ah, so now we're finding a little bit of positive in the stuff Jesus is saying. For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his life? And so uh, this is, this is uh, the, the saving. In another place, he'll tell us about the picture of a seed. A seed falls into the ground and, and dies, but then it grows up into something more. And so the image is not dying and staying dead, but dying to ourselves and actually that turns out to be far more abundant, far richer than we would have had otherwise. 
Uh, the irony is that giving up our freedom like this, which feels like death, actually brings us real freedom and life. But the, there's a moment where you think, well, what am I doing doing this? Am I just giving myself to this? Um, I don't know if any of you have done a parachute jump. I've never done a parachute jump, but I just can't imagine what it must be like leaping out of the side of the airplane and like just trusting in that parachute. I'm sure you get um, a lot of adrenaline flowing. <laughs> but um, just last week I was... I was in, in a, a high-rise building and there were, there were people outside cleaning the windows on long ropes right from the top of this skyscraper. And they were going right the way down and they were on just on a single rope. Anyway, I went into the elevator and a guy came in the elevator and he was wearing all this gear. And I thought, I must ask him about this. I said, you've got a lot of, a lot of gear on. What's that for? Oh, he said, I'm cleaning the windows. I said, what's that like? He said, to start with, it's really scary. But... After a while, you realize, actually, you're, you're very safe. In fact, you're safer than a lot of other jobs doing this. It's actually, I trust my gear. I trust my gear is really well made. And I thought, wow, what a good example for Sunday. <laughs> it's actually, he says, you know, it's scary to start with, but actually, it's a lot safer than a lot of other things because the gear is so good. Like, it's so well made. It's so well made that I can trust it. And really, this is what it's about. If we can trust it, then things are good. And uh, putting, uh, we're putting ourselves in this position, but ultimately, this death turns into life. So I want to move now to from death to life. John 10 and verse 7. Jesus again says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. And if I, I will go in and out and find, and will go in and out and find pasture. So here's a slightly different twist on the gospel message. You're, you've still got to follow me, but you're following me as a sheep and trusting me as the shepherd. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I just want to say something about having life more abundantly. I don't believe that means having more money or possessions than anyone else, because that really doesn't bring happiness. But Jesus knows what will really bring you happiness. He knows better than you. He knows your heart. He knows the pathway to joy better than you do. And if you decide, well, I'm going to have a happy life, then the chances are you're not going to, to do that. But if you give that to Jesus, he understands much better than you do what will really bring you life, life more abundantly. And he can bring you the true joy. Um, so the irony is that by giving up our freedom like this, then which feels like death, we are actually getting new life. Death leads to life. And he understands us better than anyone else. So the question then is, how do you start following him? The core of following him is to trust him as your leader. And once you do that, everything else falls into place. And so just... Praying to Jesus, praying, Lord, I want to give you my life. I want to, is, is part of becoming a Christian, just saying, please take my life. I want to live for you. And doing that from your heart is what becoming a Christian is about. But ultimately, as I said last week, you can't trust him unless you know something about him. And so there's an aspect of actually, let's read about this Jesus who I want to trust. Let me read. And so, Read the Bible, read the gospel, whether you're a Christian or not. To follow Jesus, you can't do it unless you read about him. You can't do it unless you're actually studying and reading about him. Now, um, there are, 
sadly, there are plenty of people who are true Christians who are not following Jesus very well. And none of us follow him wonderfully. All of us have got areas of our lives which are unsurrendered to him. And so I want to challenge you that there are, this morning to give everything to Jesus, whether you're a Christian or not. I want to challenge you. Am I truly following him this morning? Um, there are areas, you know, some, some people say, well, Jesus, you can have Sundays, but all the rest of the week is mine. Or you can have 10 minutes a day for my devotions and you know, everything else is mine. Or you can have a little, little bit of my money, everything is mine. Um, um, you know, it's our life goals, our relationships, our, our plans, and most of all, our energy. Where is my focus in my life? And then if you can get that lined up, then everything else will follow. Now, Jesus isn't against self-care. Jesus isn't against us looking after ourselves. In fact, he cared for himself. He said to his disciples, you know, let's go away and rest for a while after a really busy time. And Jesus wants you to look after your body. He wants you to look after, to get enough sleep. All of those things are part of following him, caring for the body and the mind that he's given you. But um, I want to uh, just try and sum it up in, in one or two things now. Um, I've decided to follow Jesus. He is my leader. I follow his pattern for my life. I trust that the cost of doing this, death to self, actually leads to life. And this is a statement that I believe is the gospel message that Jesus is, is asking. He was preaching at that time. Follow your pattern for my life and trust that the cost of doing that will actually lead to life. And what that actually looks like, two things in practice, loving others before myself. Jesus uh, said to his disciples, a new commandment I give you. What was the new commandment? That, that you love one another. <clears throat> that, was the, that, that was Jesus' main commandment. And one of the, the, the scribes came to Jesus and said, uh, what's the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus asked him. And, uh, and they talked back and forth. And the, Jesus said, the, um, the greatest commandments was loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. And really that's what it comes to. Loving, loving others and loving God. This is what following Jesus is about. And loving God is avoiding things that don't please him and making him a priority in your life. And so I want to just uh, have this up here as a summary of what we are doing today, what, are, what this message is about, and uh, uh, whether we've chosen to follow Jesus and what that means. And I'm going to get Dan to come up now because we've got, I've got a, a rather different way of responding to this this morning. I'm going to tell you a story, and then we're going to join in with the story in response. So this is the story. About 150 years ago, there was an amazing revival in the country that Anne is from. Do you know which country Anne's from? Wales. Wales, that's right. There was an amazing revival, large numbers saved, and a lot of missionaries were sent out. Some missionaries went to India, and there was a part of India called Assam, where they went to, and uh, they, they were preaching the gospel, and there was a village where there was a man and his whole family just embraced the gospel, completely decided they were going to follow Jesus, totally, totally committed to him. And this man's name was Nick Sang, uh, Nok Singh, rather, and um, he um, was completely committed to following Jesus. Now, actually, this isn't his picture, because nobody took his picture at the time, but this is the man one of the people who was, who was a witness there at the time, who saw it. Um, and anyway, what happened was, the chief of the village was very angry that this man and his family had become Christians. And he brought, had a village assembly, brought them out, and said, if you don't stop following Jesus uh, and renounce everything you've done, then I'm going to kill your two children. And the man said... I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And uh, this song was written <coughs> by somebody who heard his words and put them into words. Then they shot his children. And 
he, uh, he, he, um, they said, are you going to renounce him now? And he said, though no one joins me, I still will follow. And then they shot his wife in front of his eyes. And they said, are you going to renounce Jesus now? And he said, the cross before me, the world behind me. I'm not going to turn back. No turning back. And then they killed him. And then, when they killed him, the leader of the village was in shock because he didn't think this was going to happen. He was sure the man was going to, going to renounce Jesus and he was in shock. And he thought, what is it that has made this man so compelled him to give up everything? What is it? What could it be that's so powerful, it's stronger than death in his life? And the Holy Spirit came on him and he was saved in that moment. And he said, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. And a flame of revival burst in that village as people became Christians and decided to follow Jesus. And so that man's life, he gave his life, but many were saved. And so, uh, and this is, how, this is how this, what the song was written from. And so we are now going to, to respond to this message by singing this. And I hope you can sing it from your heart. Jesus, we want to follow you. Whatever the cost, we believe that the life that you give us is better than any suffering we could have. Lord, we want to give you all of that what we have. We want to give you our, our resources, our relationships, our goals, our dreams. We want to give them to you, Lord, because we trust you. If we give them to you, then we will receive back a hundredfold from all that you can do and all that you're doing in us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Show us, Lord, we ask any areas where we're not following you as we should and give us the power of your spirit to live and to, to follow you as, as you want us to. In your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So let's stand, shall we? And we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back Though no one joins me, though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided. Cause I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back, no turning back The world behind me The world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning back i have decided i have decided to follow jesus i have decided to follow jesus i have decided to follow jesus no turning back no turning back no turning back no turning back